Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, The Answer Company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medi-spa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. The Minnesota Twins are looking forward to another great season in 2023, led by the return of All-Stars Carlos Correa and Brian Buxton. With the return of numerous players who were injured in 2022 and some new acquisitions, another division crown and a return to the World Series are in their sights. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Hello and welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm your host, Steve Francisco. It's a pleasure to welcome back to our studio a return visitor and an occasional guest host of our program, Dane Smith. Dane, welcome back to Access to Democracy. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here again. So give our viewers who may not know you, give them the quick 30-second uh, tutorial on who you are, where you went to school, where you grew up. Uh, well, I am a Minnesotan for 50 years. I uh, moved here, uh, came here right out of the Navy. I married into Minnesota. I had uh, great education starting at Inver Hills and near here and uh, Inver Hills Community College. Went to St. Thomas, got a journalis uh, journalism degree, 30 years uh, in the news business as a reporter for both the Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune, kind of back and forth. Most of that was covering politics and government, including 20 years at the state capitol. And then, uh, and then for the capstone of my career, I uh, took a buyout in 07 and became the director of a public policy group uh, called Growth and Justice and, uh, and led that group for about 10 years and, uh, and retired just a couple of years ago. And I'm just realizing here, you and I have known each other now 39 years, coming That's up on 40 years. I was a young congressional staffer working with Bruce Vento out in Washington, right. and you right. were covering the Hill. Right. I was the Pioneer Press Washington correspondent, and so I had some, I had the great fortune of having kind of a front row seat uh, on all things Minnesota mm -hmm. for because I covered politics, policy, government, and economics too, and business, mm -hmm. and so, and also at every level of government, from federal in Washington for the Pioneer, and then at for the Star Tribune at the state capitol. <clears throat> and so I've been to every corner of the state. I, I think I know the state pretty well. I'm fascinated by its history. I'm a, I'm a true blue Minnesota promoter. I love this state. I love it to death. Uh, not to death, but I love it. <laughs> and uh, and that's uh, that informs my yeah. work that I'm here to talk about today. So you have embarked <clears throat> on a new endeavor. You are writing a series for MinPost, which right. has just debuted recently. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this series. It's the title of our program today, right. Reappraising Minnesota. Tell right. us what this is about. Right. Well, um, the series is uh, really designed to take a, a good hard look at where we are, who we are, why we are, who we are, uh, and and the sort of the, the the angle here is that this year, last month, is the 50th anniversary of this Time Magazine article. It was called "The Good Life in Minnesota," and. Uh, this, I have a little personal story about this. Tell them who's featured on the cover. Well, the, the cover is Wendell Anderson, who was the governor at the time, 
and uh, he's holding up a fish that may or may not have been caught by him, as, <laughs> I've, as, as, as we've, as researchers know, or as, as, as historians of the deep history are aware. Um, but the piece went on to describe what an incredibly successful and prosperous, more, more important, equally prosperous state Minnesota was. Mm -hmm. How it was, um, uh, uh, in many ways, an ideal society. In fact, the inside cover of the story, the, the headline was, see if I can hold this up quickly, it was, it was Minnesota, a state, state that works. That works. Right. And, and the authors of this piece went at great length to understand our history, to explain what we were all about, and they focused on some, some, uh, some things that were working for us. There was a lot of bipartisan agreement, if you can imagine that, between moderate Republicans, if you can imagine that, <laughs> and DFLers on basic stuff, education, equalizing education for everyone, uh, making sure that everyone had economic security and health care, protecting the environment was a key part of this whole series. And it talked about how this policy that really focused on uh, equal opportunity for people was producing uh, an incredibly prosperous, innovative economy. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they talked a lot about philanthropy, about the fact that the business community in Minnesota was unusually generous and and how the the importance of nonprofits and charities and 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 they they went on to describe a state that could serve as a model for the country. Mm -hmm. This was a hugely important moment for Minnesota. It put us on the map. Uh, we've often described ourselves even now as a flyover state, but it really right, meaning people flying right, over from right. east to the west. And all the action is yeah. in California or New the York. East Coast or right. Texas and there's the Sun Belt, and, and the Midwest is sort of forgotten, and then, since then the, the whole story around the Rust Belt has developed and so forth. But this made Minnesota exceptional. The whole idea of Minnesota exceptionalism was established by this magazine article, and, and, it, was, and it was actually verified by many other journals, books, and media after that uh, for quite a while. But this was the kind of moment when we were kind of discovered Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it didn't necessarily lead to a huge surge of new people coming to Minnesota. No. Maybe the winters deterred some yeah, people from right. coming, perhaps. We're still cold, and they talked about that. But there are some things unique about Minnesota, <laughs> such as our attitude toward welcoming refugees. Right. Certainly going back to the Vietnamese and Hmong people who first came to Minnesota at the, at the end of the Vietnam era. How right. did that come about? What were some yeah. of the reasons that this became a desirable place so that now we yeah. have the largest Hmong population in the U.S.? Right. Well, this had a lot to do with it. The reputation of, for Minnesota being a good place to live, a place where you could get a job at a decent wage, a place where if if you ran into hardship, there would be uh, some sort of public assistance for you. Social safety. Social safety net was mm -hmm. was an important factor, and the 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 fact is that the state uh, Minnesota's growth rate among our peers in the Midwest has been higher than any other state. Uh, we're not growing as fast as some Sun Belt and Western no. states, mm -hmm. but uh, and there's reasons for that, but. Uh, relative to our peers in the Midwest, we are still one of the healthiest, wealthiest, and pro most um, uh, evenly prosperous states. It's interesting to me, sometimes I've talked to people, including neighbors of mine, who say, well, Minnesota's uh, not that friendly a state for business, yet we have right. this record number of Fortune 500 companies that have invested right. here. A lot of small business startups that have originated here. Right. But I've also noticed some of my neighbors who say that mm -hmm. they're not from here. They came here from North Dakota, South Dakota, even Wisconsin, and moved to Minnesota. So right. we must have been doing something right if they've chosen to stay. I right. Would think. This refrain that Minnesota is bad for business is is really a a false narrative. Um, Minnesota's uh, business climate. Uh, and you can measure it a, a lot of different ways, including uh, one of my articles in this series is about just about rankings. Mm -hmm. uh, business magazines like Forbes, uh, U.S. News and World Report, magazines that are have no interest in promoting our political mm -hmm. agenda or anything, all rank us in the top five or ten 
for business. And that and that's not, it, it is true that we do tax wealthy people more, um, but their business taxes actually are comparable to other states and competitive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's always been this sort of tension around the fact that uh, we redistribute here, and we do so uh, with an eye towards making sure that everybody is reaching their full potential. Now that is a recipe for success as we can see in all the liberal democracies all over the world. Minnesota is kind of like the Nordic model among in the nation that of success and equality that we see in, in, um, mm -hmm. in Europe. Because it seems like the people who came to Minnesota, and I'm talking 150 years ago, the uh, original white European settlers mm -hmm. who came here, certainly the Native Americans have been here for centuries, mm -hmm. but many of the European immigrants, they came from Scandinavia, they came from Germany, right. and they came from places where there was a history of social democracy, if you right. will and the rise of trade union movements, they came looking for a better life. So right. they brought those values here to Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Exactly, I get deeply into that in the fourth installment in this series where I talk about our essence, how our essence, how we came to be. And I talk about this Native American tradition of communitarian values, sharing and sharing alike, reverence for the for the environment and living with in harmony with nature as opposed to it and this this is coming along this is coming out of a real rebirth we're seeing native american leadership in this state again around a lot of environmental issues pipeline issues really important right um, but you're right then on top of that we had new england um uh, a new england uh pioneers who were more egalitarian more interested in equality than the southern colonies mm -hmm. uh, who came th this way and who had put a strong emphasis on public institutions, universities, hospitals, schools, um, an equal right to education that didn't exist in the southern colonies. So we benefited from that New England liberalism. We're talking about families with names like Pillsbury, Pillsbury, Dayton, exactly. Cargill, other families that came here uh, from that background who had much more of an right. attitude towards civic engagement. There was there was a feeling that if you had wealth, you shared it. The nobility had some obligations, and that, um, and then you had the Scandinavians who really reinforced, in a way, uh, that no other state has this idea of communitarian uh, values mm -hmm. and. Um, the idea that we should, that cooperative models, and by the way, they were instrumental in starting the cooperative movement in this state, mm -hmm. That's right. and many pro other progressive movements. The whole idea was that cooperation is just as important as competition right. in our, in our seems, economic lives. It seems, doesn't it, Dane, as if the upper Midwest has always been fertile ground for reform movements. You think of the Nonpartisan League in yes. North Dakota, the progressive movement, uh, Robert La Follette in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and in Minnesota, our own farmer labor tradition later merging with the Democratic Party becoming the DFL. But there have also been Republican progressives too, haven't certainly, there? Luther certainly. Luther Youngdahl, Harold Stassen. Yeah, the time, the time, this time edition actually gets into that and talks a lot about uh, how important uh, liberal Republicans were in the states uh, and the good life that was that it, that they created. described at this time and that they created. And in fact, it's true. I mean, Stassen did not try to uh, abolish the New Deal or roll back the fact of taxes and government. He he worked at making it at uh, function better. Right. And and we saw with many uh, liberals up through our time, all through our times, including Arne Carlson who put Minnesota care into law. There was an emphasis on environmentalism, there was an emphasis on improving government services, and the, but the Republican Party uh, has, and this is a really important theme throughout this series, uh, has changed since then, and it's one of our biggest problems. It is it has transitioned from a good government party to an anti-government party. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's so much less cooperation now on on Min on traditional Minnesota values, and and policy and, that and policy polarization proposals. sort of reflects does reflect what we've seen happening at the national level for some time now. Absolutely, yeah. and and in some degrees, it's it's almost worse here. Um, I do uh, uh, try to shine a light on the biggest problems we have, um, and I think they are these. 
First and foremost is racial inequality. We have, since 1973, when this, wrote, when this was written, we went from 2% non-white population to 25%. Mm -hmm. That growth rate of 12-fold 12 12 is among the highest in the nation. We did not cope with it. We did not, we did not welcome these newcomers and, and give them the equity ownership in this state that we should have. And so I really uh, can't stress this enough. I think this new emphasis on equity, inclusion, and our new diversity is it has to be job one for Minnesota. And I, mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason I did the series is because there's a lot of negativism and pessimism following the George Floyd uprising. Right. And I think a lot of people look at that and think, oh, how we've declined from the old days. But, Not true. It is a wake-up call, and we need to wake up to it, yeah. and I think we are. Some of the problems we see when you talk about this, so it's not a panacea, progressive panacea, saying everything's great here, there are no problems. No. Obviously, there are, right. but it seems like some of these problems are rooted in historical discrimination regarding housing patterns, yes. that people of color could not buy homes in neighborhoods right. in Minneapolis and St. Paul years ago. Right. That's the number, way, number one way that a lot of people people build wealth, personal wealth is through home ownership. Exactly. We had and a much so more had impacts there too. We had a much more subtle form of segregation and right. and neglect. Uh, it was sort of a benign neglect, but actually it was not benign in its effects. Uh, you're right, housing covenants and a variety of other right. informal attitudes prevented us from um, uh, granting full first-class citizenship to all of our newcomers. And I think, I, I, you know, th this new emphasis, wokeness, if you will, and I consider myself to be as woke as an old white guy can possibly be, is important. It is important to wake up to this and to, and to address it and to recognize it and to invest in people the way we did when, um, when we were all white. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, too, let's talk about what's happened with our Native American population here in Minnesota. Here are mm -hmm. the people that were here before the European population arrived, right. before the first Scandinavians arrived mm -hmm. in Minnesota, and it seems that they have really been at the bottom in terms of educational opportunities, home ownership opportunities. Mm -hmm. Many of them still live on reservation lands in northern Minnesota, White Earth and Red Lake and elsewhere. Right. Um, now certainly you have the casinos, uh, which right. have injected some wealth into those communities, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. But there's still a lot of poverty in those counties. The poorest county in Minnesota, <laughs> I believe, is up on the White Earth Reservation, Monoman County. Right. So and it's, how, do, how do we turn the table on that, Dane? I'm mm -hmm. interested in your thought on that. How can we change it so that those folks have a better future too and become part of Minnesota? Well, I think we may have been maybe turning the corner on this. Our lieutenant governor is a Native American. Peggy um, Flanagan. Peggy Flanagan. The um, first Native she, American to be elected to right. statewide office. And, right. she, and she herself has said this, that we that we are turning a corner on this. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some good things have happened. Uh, there's much more recognition of, of tribal sovereignty over the last 50 years. Um, they, uh, Native American communities are actually in control of their own destinies to a degree they were not b before 1973 and before they were given um, the, uh, the gaming enterprise as, a, as, a economic sec as an economic um, asset. The uh, the numbers are are I don't I don't claim to have all the answers. I do try to look forward as to what what's in the works, mm -hmm. what can what can turn these things around. But um, certainly uh, recognition of their uh, demands to um, uh, keeping their land and their waters uh, safe is a is a big part of this. Right. Their opposition to pipelines, their opposition to mining, and so forth, all related, should, should be taken seriously. You've contended in your articles that Minnesotans, while we may have our political differences. We tend to be drawn to candidates frequently who shake things up, as you put mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And but there seems to be, as you call it, a centrist consensus, center-left right. consensus right. about equality of opportunity right. and moving people forward. Let me ask you about that because one other division that we see in Minnesota, we see a an increasing divide, which you note in your articles mm -hmm. about the divide between the Twin Cities Metro 
-hmm. and greater Minnesota, mm -hmm. rural Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And it's reflected in the voting patterns of people who live in those respective areas. Mm -hmm. Democrats tend to do better in the Twin Cities metro for sure. Much better. In rural areas, yeah. they used to elect DFLers to the legislature, right. but there are essentially none anymore in the legislature. Right. So how do we go forward with that kind of polarization, mm -hmm. the urban-rural divide in Minnesota, yeah. which is more pronounced now than it seems it's ever been? Right. Well, I've got an episode, or uh, one of these uh, installments will address that specifically, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I'm still writing it, but the, I've, I've written about a lot, a, about it a lot in the past. And to some extent, this is driven by increasing right-wing emphasis on social issues. Uh, I think Greater Minnesota is still coming to terms with its own uh, unsettling homophobia. There's a lot of that out there. I saw these numbers, these counties go from red to blue after the gay marriage was approved. I, we can't go back on that. Um, I think I think the divide is a little overstated. There are big pockets of blue out still in northeastern Minnesota, and in any metro area of any size, including Wilmer, Winona, Mankato, right. wherever there's a college, there's a lot of... Rochester, Rochester right. has changed. I remember growing right. up in the 60s and 70s here, Rochester was solid red. Absolutely. All of southern Minnesota was, but you now have right. diverse populations in Rochester, Albert Lee and Austin, people right. working in the meatpacking industry. Right. You have Latino populations in some of these mm -hmm. towns that are growing, mm -hmm. but overall there still seems to be this red-blue divide, doesn't right. there? Right, and a lot of it is... Uh, has been there forever. Uh, even in the 70s, there was uh, the, the, this article and others drew attention to the to the more conservative uh, attitudes in rural as opposed to urban areas. Mm -hmm. This has always always sort of been true. I, I want to point out in this series that I I, I do go to great lengths to uh, give an enormous credit to the Republicans in the past who helped shape the state, who cooperated in our general progressive direction. Um, and if you examine who held office over the last 50 years, and you just do Republican and Democrat, it's only about 58% Democratic control of the three main offices over the 150 years of the governor's Senate mm. and the two Senate seats. But if you look more closely at where they were on the ideological spectrum, and you include the fact that Dave Durenberger, our senator, Arnie Carlson, our governor for two terms, uh, even Norm Coleman, who emphasized working across the divide and was a former Democrat, if you, if you categorize it by a left-right continuum, 86 percent of that control of those offices has been by the center-left. And that, I think that's an important new analysis that I bring to this piece. That's where Minnesota is. That's very and interesting. And where it remains. So contrary to what some people may claim or think, it right. hasn't always been Democrats or so-called progressives who moved the state there. They couldn't have done it without Republican centrist cooperation. Exactly. Uh, which is more and more difficult to come by. I want to ask you, we're getting down to our last four minutes here. There are a couple of issues I want to cover real quickly with you. Minnesota is going through this massive demographic change, the way mm -hmm. the rest of the nation is, mm -hmm. and that is the retirement of the baby boom generation creating millions of new job openings. Right. Can Minnesota still have a strong, vibrant economy without immigration? We hear a big debate <laughs> in this country about people coming into the country, the process, the legality of how they come in, all up for debate a very right. intense emotional debate sometimes, but how do you see the immigration issue affecting Minnesota's future? Can we possibly maintain this affluence that we have unless we have immigrants to help fill the jobs that are being created or opening? In a word, no. <laughs> we have to have immigrants. In fact, I would urge people to look at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, not normally a conservative Republican mm -hmm. voice, what they have to say about this. They say we cannot do anything to restrict further immigration, that we need to welcome even more people. And the way you do that is you make uh, jobs uh, pay better. You, you include the benefits like paid family leave. We need a, a, a public policy that is clearly perceived as pro-worker because we need more workers. And, and I, I've just, I, I can't emphasize enough how much business leadership in this state 
uh, benefits from from immigrant labor and and where they stand on it. They are not with the Trump publicans on building walls and discouraging uh, people from other nations from from enjoying our democracy. You've observed that over 50 years, over the past 50 years since the Time Magazine article came out, we have seen the political pendulum swing. It right. has swung sometimes to the left. There have been good mm -hmm. years for Democrats. Some years, mm -hmm. 1978, 1994, mm -hmm. it swung right. the other direction toward Republicans. Right. Um, do you have, how do you think the rise of Trumpism and this uh, sort of populist, nationalist attitude toward politics, how is that impacting Minnesota? And do yeah. you, la last question, we're down to about a minute and 15. Does Donald Trump have a chance of winning Minnesota in 2024, in your opinion? He came close yeah. in 2016. Right. He didn't carry the state. He right. didn't carry it in 2020. What happens? Right, there's always a chance, but I think his chances are very, very slim for taking Minnesota. Minnesota, since uh, the more conservative brand of Republican has taken over the party and fielded these candidates, have not won a statewide election now in, more, in almost 20 years. Um, and so uh, I think uh, Minnesotans' mind is made up on that. Uh, I, don't, I think of the minute the Republicans put up a more moderate candidate, if they can somehow figure out how to get through their system and their primaries and their endorsements to, to that end, they will enjoy success again. They'll have much more to talk about. Dane, you and I have much more to talk about on this and other topics <laughs> yeah. related to your series. Hope to come your back. Your series is appearing in MemPost. We right. definitely want to have you back on. Thanks for appearing on Access to Democracy. Thank you.